Boom. All right. Take it away, gentlemen. Excellent. Here we are. Roma, you're on. We're on. Good morning. It's nice, uh, you know, Chet and I were just talking. We, we we used to travel a lot for those conferences, and it's nice we don't have to anymore, but it's nice to have a conference that's very early in the morning because it, it reminds me of being uh, tired because of jet lag and so on. It has that feel of traveling uh, without <laughs> actually <laughs> Uh, yeah, true. Virtual conferences and virtual jet lag. Uh, and here we are. I So I've been planning on going to Sh Chicago Roboto for uh, how many years has it been going? At least the last couple and haven't made it. I was going to make it this year. And now I have um, without the flight. So how convenient. All I had to do was remember to wake up on time. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Modern Android Development. We're going to dive in because we have about a million slides to go through, so we're going to rip through pretty quickly. I'm Chad Haas from the Android Developer Relations team. And I'm Roman Guy from the Android Toolkit team. And this is a talk um, titled, much like talks that we've given in the past, um, this phrase, modern Android development, is not one that we just started using. Um, in fact, uh, we used it back in 2018. We gave a talk at Android Makers in Paris about modern Android development, and then uh, at uh, DevOps France, um, I think, the, the next week. And then we also talked about it at Google I.O. that same year. And then in, in the fall, <laughs> yes? You're selling our secret, like, this is our scam. We keep <laughs> reusing the same content for years and years. Don't tell them. No, well, the, the weird thing is, the content is completely different now, uh, but we did reuse the title completely because apparently there aren't enough words in the English language. Um, Android Developers Summit we talked about in 2019, and then uh, and then wait, oh yeah, Google I/O. Uh, wait, what am I? I thought there was one more. Yeah. Anyway, oh, I, we talked about it in Greece as well. So we have done many many talks called Modern Android Development. This one is a little bit different because now we mean something specific. We, as the Android team, mean something specific about Modern Android Development, and that is the point of this talk: is to explain what we mean by this, and what are the pieces of the Android. Uh, platform and unbundled uh, libraries and tools that um, we are talking about that we really want developers to learn about and use in your development flow. So first, why don't we talk about classic Android development? So just a quick history lesson, uh, just to refresh our, our memory and remind ourselves of how the, the Android development has evolved. So it all started in 2007 when we introduced the first SDK for Android. It was called M3. And that's where we introduce pretty much everything that you already know today, the activities, you know, the Java programming language, uh, APKs, this new way of bundling applications, and our first ID, which was based on Eclipse by then. About a year later, uh, we had the, the first version of the public SDK, so version 1.0 that came out with the platform. And then pretty much not much happened uh, for many, many years. Uh, of course, we, we introduced tons of new APIs with every new version of Android. Uh, but we didn't change anything fundamental uh, around how you program applications for Android and what tools you use until 2013 when we introduced Android Studio based on the IntelliJ platform. So that was the first big change we made. Uh, and then we kept working on new things we could do to make your life easier. So in 2017, we introduced a new programming language on the platform with Kotlin, uh, followed by Arch Components and the move to Android X. Uh, and then uh, more recently, app bundles, uh, which Chet is going to uh, talk about in more details later. So we want to talk about some of the things that were sort of fundamental things that everybody knew and, and used about Android. Uh, the classic um, thing everybody was familiar with was, of course, language, the Java programming language, which uh, we used. Uh, really good reasons for picking this up for the platform. Large um, base of developers that knew how to use Java programming language, uh, patterns and practices. Um, there were tools out there such as Eclipse that were free and a lot of developers were using them already. Um, there were libraries out there that people could continue using uh, middleware stuff and just general approaches that they had to um, their programming lives. And uh, it had the advantage of, well, then this is it's pretty, you know common and expected now, but uh, at the time it was one of the main languages people were using with automatic memory management as opposed to uh, the C and C++ native um, programming environments that a lot of developers were coming from. 
Uh, and then I mentioned Eclipse as the base, uh, the basis for our ID. So we had the ADT uh, plugin, as a plugin for the Eclipse platform. And the reason why we went with Eclipse uh, is, is basically twofold. Uh, first, it was free. It was a very, very good free tool. A lot of developers were familiar with it. Eclipse was, and I assume still is, uh, outside of the Android world, a very, very popular ID. So it made a lot of sense for us to piggyback on that as much as possible. Uh, besides, the tools team was very small back then. Uh, so we couldn't rewrite an ID from scratch. Oh, uh, also Dimension was free. Uh, that was kind of nice for, for developers. Um, and as part of the, the plugin, you know, we could go a little further than just letting you click the build and run buttons or, or, or the debug button. We could also int integrate sub tools in the ID. So things like the profiler, for instance, uh, which was nice. And of course, it was a free tool. Uh, the APIs that everybody was familiar with at the time uh, were basically the APIs in the platform itself, right? So we released um, releases very frequently. We'll see a little timeline of that in a minute here. Um, so there were constantly new fixes and APIs and functionality come out that we would push into new releases. And then hopefully we'd get on the devices and we'd encourage developers to uh, spin up on um, those new things in the platform. Very frequent in the beginning, as we'll see in this timeline. Sometimes the team was working on at least these two, sometimes three releases in parallel and shipping these things, you know, two to four times a year in the beginning. Um, fundamental new functionality, lots of bug fixes going on uh, all the time. So there was 1.0, which Clement talked about earlier, and then 1.1 was a fast follow up early 2009. 1.5, the cupcake release. Um, came out a couple of months after that, 1.6 toward the end of that year, and then 2.0. And you know, you look at the frequency of these things. Isn't that horrifying? <laughs> How much was going on at that time? Uh, and then up and up and up. And then eventually we got into sort of a regular cadence of once a year we would come out with uh, the new platform release, new bug fixes and functionality. A little easier for everyone to handle, uh, not just the team, but also the developers that uh, had to spin up on this stuff and also the partners and manufacturers um, that needed to integrate this functionality into their devices. Uh, and to distribute your app, you, we, we introduced this new format, APK, so the Android packages. It's effectively a zip file, but it was different from the way uh, folks were used to creating applications on, let's say, Windows or, or, or Linux. Um, so it contains you know, your code, you have your text file, and then you have your pre-compiled resources. Now, one of the big issues with APKs was the more configurations you added support for, so let's say more res resolutions as we started introducing uh, different screen sizes, the bigger your APK got. Uh, and of course, you know, with larger screen resolutions, bitmaps, which were the, the main way to, to distribute assets back then, we didn't have the, the vector drawable support yet, uh, were large. So the APKs like started getting really, really big. And the phones back, you know, back then, even tablets, did not have much storage. So a lot of apps were spending quite a bit of time you know, trying to optimize for size, uh, which is not something you should be doing. You should be worrying about your code uh, instead. So those were the classic uh, things that developers expected to learn and use in Android development. And there were some classic problems that came along with those. So in the language space, Java programming language, all of the advantages that we talked about before, but it is, especially in today's uh, uh, world, verbose, right? A lot of code that you need to, to write to get the point across in that language. Um, and so we mentioned using Eclipse, uh, obviously we switched to IntelliJ. There were several reasons for that. One of them was Eclipse itself was, was difficult to customize. Eclipse is designed as a, as a very generic plugin platform. Um, and it made it very difficult in particular to have the sub tools have consistent UIs. Besides, we were not completely in control of that platform, uh, actually not in control at all. So it was very easy for us uh, to do things that would not that would stop working, or we didn't have access to some of the APIs we wanted to use to be able to. I remember that Chet wanted the, the tools team to introduce new features, and they said that they couldn't uh, just because they, they just didn't have those APIs. And on top of that, because you know Eclipse was was successful and got a very large market share, at some point the core ID itself was not actively improved. A lot of work went into the plugins but not in the areas that mattered a lot to us, like the core Java programming language support. Uh, so we started thinking about another way where we could have something that was more user-friendly and where we could offer like more features uh, to our users. 
On the API front, uh, as I said, we basically had the platform API. So these ships with the platform and that's what all developers needed to use. So if there's new functionality, new bug fixes, they needed to be using um, those new versions of the platform APIs. And of course the limitation is uh, the users for the apps that developers are writing needed to actually get those releases it was difficult for developers to adopt all of this stuff because they needed to be driven by what releases the users had. And most of the users still had those old releases. So how could they start using the new stuff if nobody was gonna see that besides the developers? Um, also, there were a fair number of APIs in the platform that were complicated, somewhat necessarily because it turns out that mobile development is complicated. All the stuff that you can do on the device, uh, constrained memory and performance situations, limited battery, some of those very, you know, a lot of those still very true today, but even more so back uh, in the olden days of mobile development. Um, but also the fact that you could talk to the cloud, you could talk to the local device, you've got a camera, you've got all these, you know, sort of infinite capabilities. There's a lot of complexity uh, dealing with that and that fed into some of the APIs and made uh, sort of a complicated um, development environment that developers needed to understand things like life cycle, uh, sort of the, the classic complication in Android, understanding when your application is you know, running and paused and resumed and uh, the uh, plethora of storage options out there, um, the ability to sort of navigate through your app in a consistent way with other apps on the device, um, somewhat complex. <laughs> And for APKs, uh, so you, you, over the years, we, we started trying to tackle this problem of having very large APKs. So you, you had a couple of cho choices. You could create a monolithic APK to handle all the configurations that you supported. And we just mentioned that you know this would create fairly large applications that users uh, uh, might not want to download for, for several reasons. Uh, but we also had different techniques, like for instance, split APKs, where you could create multiple APKs for your application. Uh, that would be targeted at different ABIs or different configuration. The problem is that we're asking you to do a lot of the work and it was a pretty complicated process. And I know a lot of apps were choosing not to do this un until they had to because it was that much more complicated uh, in the development process. So over the last few years, we looked at a lot of these problems, the collection of these problems, and started coming up with um, solutions to address them one by one. And then finally, more recently, we thought, you know, we should really sort of put these things together into a single concept and surface area uh, so that we can point developers uh, at this as the way to approach Android development. And that is what we're calling mod modern Android development. So when we use that phrase, when we talk about modern Android development, we are talking about those pieces of the unbundled libraries and the tools and the language and the approaches um, that developers should look at to write their applications uh, as opposed to the classic stuff that everybody spun up on, you know, five, 10, uh, 12 years ago. Um, so uh, specifically, I'll go ahead and read this quote since I wrote it, I might as well. Development tools, APIs, language and distribution technologies recommended by the Android team to help developers be productive and create better apps that run across billions of devices. So we're gonna look at basically four pillars of this uh, in this talk, um, we think of this in in these in terms of these uh, sort of four categories. So first of all, there's language, and then there's tools, and then there's the APIs that you're actually using, uh, and then how do you distribute your application? All of this is built on the fundamental foundation of platform and play technologies and those platform APIs, which many of which you still uh, use and need to use, but that we're sort of taking that as given. It's the rest of the stuff, the, the more optional pieces um, that we really want to drill into here and make sure that developers know about and learn and use. Chad, I love that uh, to illustrate modern Android development, you chose to draw something that looks like an ancient ruin. <laughs> well, the that think of this as like we started talking internally about the pillars of modern Android development. And of course, I'm an engineer. So if somebody says a word, I'm going to take it very, very literally. And so I drew some pillars. So there they are. Isn't that a nice drawing? I think it's very pretty. It's a beautiful drawing. All right. So it all starts with the programming language. Uh, of course, we're talking about Kotlin, uh, a new modern, a modern take on what JVM programming languages uh, can be when you're on the server side or the desktop side. Um, so if we look at the timeline of the, 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 the history of Kotlin on Android, it goes like this. In, in 2016, uh, JetBrains released version 1.0 of Kotlin. That's when a lot of developers started looking at it seriously. Obviously, some of you uh, had been using it before 1.0. But we started getting more and more requests from you know, app developers wanting to use Kotlin on the platform. 
And while we didn't really need to support it because you could compile to uh, to Java bytecode and then from Java bytecode to Dex uh, bytecode to run on Android, we because we didn't look at it, we tended to uh, break support for Kotlin fairly fairly frequently. Every time we updated Android Studio, for instance, we would lag behind you know, some of the new versions of the Kotlin plugin, or there would be changes somewhere in the, in the pipeline uh, that would prevent you from using the latest versions of Kotlin. So listening you know, to, to all of you, uh, we heard it loud and clear that many of you wanted to use the, the Kotlin programming language. Uh, some of us have been looking at it internally as well, and we we, we felt it was time to uh, bring it to the Android platform. So in 2017 at Google I.O., we officially announced support for, for uh, Kotlin, and that meant that we were committed um, to supporting it, so not breaking it in our tool chain and trying to maybe th to, to think about it when we introduce new platform APIs to make sure that the new APIs are Kotlin friendly. Uh, and we, we kept working uh, with Kotlin and we really liked what we saw and we saw a like, great adoption in the applications. Uh, a lot of you were extremely pleased with it. Uh, and we started in incorporating it into some of our libraries. Uh, for instance, we, we created Kotlin extensions for the core platform APIs, for some of the Jetpack libraries. We worked on more training and documentations and code labs and things like that. So last year at Google I.O., we announced that Android goes Kotlin first. Uh, and we're going to have some examples of what that means exactly uh, in a little bit. Uh, and uh, this year, we also announced uh, that coroutines are our recommended solution if you use Kotlin for uh, if you want to do async programming. So now here we are. Uh, this is you know, still fairly early for the, the support of Kotlin on the platform. We're still doing a lot of stuff. We're working very closely with JetBrains. But let's take a look at some, some more details of, uh, of Kotlin uh, if you're not using it already. So I mentioned that you know, we adapted Kotlin because a lot of you asked us to adopt it. Uh, and we looked at it and we really liked it. And those are some of the reasons why we liked it so much. So first of all, uh, Kotlin is a very expressive language. You have to type a lot less boilerplate. Uh, you can be extremely concise in the code you type. You can express really complex problems in a way that's easy to write, but also very easy to read. So it makes maintenance a lot better for, especially for large applications. When we started Android, um, Android applications were fairly small. We we're talking about like, you know, maybe a few dozen thousand lines of code at most. And now it's pretty common to see large applications in the millions of lines of code. So that makes a huge difference. Uh, type safety obviously was also a big win uh, for from Kotlin. So here we're talking about the, the support of nullability in the at the language level itself. So there's a distinction at the language itself between a type that can be null and a type can, that can be not null, uh, which helps catch at, at compile time a lot of potential programming errors. So if you pass null to an API that expects a non-null type, the, the compiler will refuse to compile your code, which saves you a lot of time at, uh, in debugging and at runtime. The interrupt with Java uh, was also paramount, uh, um, obviously. Uh, you know, I mentioned that apps have been growing, they are very complex, and of course, Nobody's going to switch to Kotlin overnight and rewrite a complete code base. So it makes sense to go with Kotlin if you if you write a new uh, application today, for instance. But if you have an existing code base, the interrupt between Kotlin and Java means that you can slowly adopt Kotlin. You can slowly rewrite your code, or or maybe never rewrite code that that that, that is working. Uh, you can just add a new code in Kotlin and let the previous code in Java, and it will all work. Something else that uh, that we found very interesting was the way that JetBrains was thinking about structured concurrency. So this is everything surrounding coroutines, right, for async programming. So this is a way to avoid uh, what's often referred to as callback hell. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you who have, who have used RxJava, for instance, will know what, I, uh, what I'm referring to. Uh, and so coroutines offer very interesting and easy solutions to many problems around concurrency or even parallelism uh, with some of the APIs. Uh, and gives you a very clean, concise, and easy way to write the code, but also to read it. You, you just read the code from top to bottom, and you understand what's going on. You don't have to think about like all those callbacks, and you know they can come in asynchronously. So if we look at code, uh, we're going to look at some of the, the actual language features that, that, we, that we mentioned. Uh, so first, the nullability in the, in the type system. So here we have a bundle. When you create an activity, it has a question mark, which means it can be null. So again, at compile time, we're going to uh, the compiler is going to make sure that you do not pass null. Then we have the uh, better support for Lambda. So Lambdas also exist in the Java programming language, uh, but Kotlin adds that that one nice little extra feature uh, that we really love. So if, if a Lambda is the last parameter of a function, instead of passing the Lambda 
inside the parentheses, you know, as an argument to the function, you can just open the, the curly braces and put code right there. It makes the code a lot more readable. And in a way, it almost feels like you're, you're writing, uh, you're adding new language features to the language in, in a very simple manner. Um, and libraries like Jetpack Compose, for instance, make heavy use of this uh, to, to, to create code that's really easy to write and, and really nice to read. Uh, then we have extension functions. Uh, I know this is one of Chet's favorite features, and it has been extremely helpful for us uh, as developers of libraries. So it's extension functions uh, are not a new concept. They, existing, uh, they existed before in Groovy, for instance. Um, so this, this is a way to add an API to an existing class without modifying that class. Uh, fundamentally, at the VM level, it, it lives as a static function. Uh, the text, for instance, in this case, we have string that capitalize, so just text string as a first parameter. And it's a very easy way to, to, to keep your types very small um, and, and very simple. And then you can add all the complex APIs or the, the domain-specific APIs you want as extension functions in other parts of your code or in other libraries. So that means we don't have to make this extremely complex base class like we've done with Vue, but we can still add APIs later. Uh, and this is how we've been delivering cutting extensions for our core APIs, for our core platform APIs. And uh, we're going to see an example of that in, in, a, in a moment. Uh, template expressions or string interpolation, also not something new, uh, not a new idea, but extremely powerful, you know, makes it a lot easier to format strings. Uh, and finally, uh, properties. Uh, so instead of writing getters and setters by hand, uh, Kotlin has, has a shorthand for that. And then you can use properties uh, as basically fields. Uh, but you're going to call the get and set, set methods so you can customize what they do, but you get this like nice, clean way on, of managing the properties. Uh, so all of this, you know, to us means, means something, something very useful and that's speed. So we're talking here about speed of development. Uh, so speed of development is, is two things. It's speed of, of writing code and reading code. So, you know, it, it improves your, your workflow, makes you more productive. It's also the speed of language evolution. So now the Java programming language also evolved faster, but Kotlin being newer, uh, it's easier for Kotlin to, to evolve at uh, almost breakneck speed. Uh, so for instance, you know, core routines was experimental a year ago. Uh, now they're fully supported. And now we have flow to support streaming values back from core routine. Uh, extension methods that I, I just mentioned are a great way to, to evolve uh, outside of the language as well. So, a lot is happening in, in the Kotlin world, uh, and, and clearly it's not, uh, not going to stop anytime soon. So I mentioned that uh, Kotlin was, was pretty popular amongst our developers. So uh, these are, this is some data that we, that we, that we track internally. So 60% of pro Android developers are already using Kotlin, and 70% of the top 1,000 apps on Play Store contain some Kotlin code. So the top 1,000 apps are the top most, uh, 1,000 most downloaded apps on Play Store. So as you can see, like uh, it's it's making uh, it's getting a lot of market share, and most of you are probably already using it. So inside Android, uh, we're working with JetBrains, uh, with the Kotlin Foundation. We're using Kotlin ourselves, but of course, we're doing more than that. So in tooling, for instance, we've been doing a lot to make sure Kotlin experience as as good as possible. So we added bin checks uh, to enforce best, practice, best practices. We have a dedicated compiler team. So for instance, the RA tool that you can use to optimize your APK is now Kotlin aware, and there's a lot of optimizations that are specific to the type of code that's generated by the Kotlin compiler. Uh, we've been working on annotation processing speed. We recently announced a new project called KSP, the Kotlin Symbol Processor. It's a faster, uh, faster way to do annotation processing uh, with Kotlin. And we work with JetBrains directly on the compiler, so we help them, for instance, on optimizations uh, of the new backend and the new frontend. Uh, we're also trying to improve the platform. The platform, of course, was designed without Kotlin in mind, so it didn't have the notion of, the notion of nullability. Uh, we use a set of, of, of annotations, so recently nullable and recently non-null are the equivalent of nullable and non-null, except instead of yielding compilation errors, they yield compilation warnings. Um, and after a release, we can switch those recently annotations to the real nullable and non-null annotations uh, because, you know, obviously you fixed all the warnings in your code base. And this is also useful for Java programming uh, language users because it gives them more information about the, about the, uh, the APIs. Uh, I mentioned Kotlin extension library, so uh, what we call KTX, uh, a way for us to improve the uh, various existing APIs. Uh, and we're going to switch to an example. So let's say you want to 
turn a drawable into a bitmap. So before the KTX uh, libraries, you had to like glue together a bunch of different APIs. So first on the bitmap class, you have to use create bitmap. Then on drawable, you have to use the draw method that takes a canvas. And this is the kind of code you would write in your application. So first you have to save the bounds of your application. Then you have to set the new bounds on the drawable. You create your bitmap. You draw the drawable onto the bitmap, and then you restore the old bounds. With KTX, you have a single extension function on the drawable class called to bitmap. Uh, you can pass the width and the height you want and an optional config, so you don't have to specify ARGB888. And from your app, this is what it looks like. You call just mydrawable.toBitmap, and that's it. So our KTX libraries, if you don't know them, offer dozens of such extensions on common platform types uh, to, to perform like fairly common uh, operations that Android developers need to do. On the library front, uh, we've also been working on Kotlin-specific APIs. So for instance, in the Room and Work Manager libraries, we've added support for coroutines. Our paging library has been completely rewritten from scratch uh, to be written now in Kotlin, so that's in paging three. And we have Jetpack Compose, our new UI toolkit that's written entirely in Kotlin and relies on, on a Kotlin compiler plugin, so it's deeply embedded in the world of Kotlin. Uh, and if you go to developer.android.com, uh, we have released a lot of materials and we're, we are still releasing a lot of ma materials to help you uh, be you know, the best Kotlin programmers possible. So we have documentation, samples, code lab, courses, various articles and videos. Uh, one of my favorites is the Kotlin vocabulary series that explores in detail some of the features of the Kotlin language. So onto tools, uh, we mentioned switching from Eclipse to Android Studio. Uh, uh, so quick history lesson. So we announced uh, support for Android Studio, uh, well, actually we announced Android Studio in 2013. And for a while we had Android Studio, our new ID, uh, supporting in parallel with Eclipse, the existing ID. Uh, in 2016, we introduced a new constraint layout editor. So the new visual editor inside Android Studio. And that's when we officially deprecated uh, the Eclipse ADT plugin. So until then, we were you know, fixing major issues in Eclipse, but uh, we've completely abandoned it. Uh, then with version 3 of Android Studio in 20, uh, 2017, we added support for Kotlin, because obviously we, we announced we were supporting Kotlin on the platform. And we introduced a suite of profilers. So we had a, a, not just a performance profiler, but also CPU, memory, and network profiling support. In 3.1, uh, D8 became the new compiler for Dex code, so it was a more efficient way of compiling your, your code for Android. Then we added even more profilers. We, into, into, uh, uh, we moved Ctrace to Android Studio. We added uh, an energy profiler. In 3.3, we added the navigation editor, editor. So that one was interesting because we developed the navigation library at the same time as the navigation editor. So we were able, just like with constraint layout and the constraint layout editor, we were able to to add support in the library for the tools uh, to make the tools better. Uh, more recently, in 3.6, earlier this year, we, we added support for view binding, uh, as well as new things that just came out recently uh, in, in the fork series, uh, things like uh, the new database inspector, for instance, and the motion editor. So the motion editor is a continuation of the constraint layout editor, except it adds support for animations. Uh, and of course, in the meantime, you know, because we, we, we rely on the IntelliJ platform, uh, we benefit from everything that, uh, that JetBrains has been doing in IntelliJ. So we have you know, more powerful code refactoring. We have a, a more e extensible UI where we can introduce like uh, complex tools, for instance, all the profilers or the, the visual editor. Uh, we work on the core and plugin in collaboration with JetBrains. We have a tight integration with Kotlin and Gradle that's coming from JetBrains, the lean checks, the, bug fi the, the quick fixes, and, and so on. Uh, and we we keep trying to uh, introduce new tools related to our library. So you know, I mentioned the navigation, the navigation editor. We have the layout editor for constraint layout. But we did the same with data binding, with room, with database inspector, and hopefully we're going to do more in the coming years. All right. So let's move into APIs. We still have about a million slides to go. I'm going to rip really quickly through this stuff. So you can think of the APIs that we're talking about as the unbundled libraries, which are Android Jetpack, more specifically a subset. Android Jetpack is huge. There's more than 80 libraries that we ship there. They're all great. We encourage you to use them, especially because they're unbundled work across releases. But when we talk about modern Android development, we're really talking about uh, a much smaller subset of those that are all about making Android development 
um, easier. Uh, so modern API, a little history lesson on this. Uh, constraint layout we see is sort of the beginning of this uh, back in 2017. And then architecture components, this is really the fundamental, the core of, of the uh, APIs that we're talking about here. Life cycles, view model, room. Uh, then we introduced Jetpack, which sort of bundled these things together along with um, guidelines and other libraries along the way, including navigation, work manager, uh, material design components is uh, part of modern Android development, making it easier easier to achieve that uh, better looking and consistent uh, UI in your application. And uh, we announced Jetpack Compose. Uh, it's still in alpha right now, um, but we consider this as a future part of modern Android development. And Camera X is in beta, again, future part of modern Android development. Um, and uh, more recently in Android Studio, we came out with Motion Editor to make uh, the motion layout much easier to design for uh, and so sort of the the integration of the tools experience plus the APIs is kind of a, a powerful combination. So uh, I'll show some details about some of these constraint layout, making it much easier to design these rich APIs. I think of it as relative layout plus plus. It's what relative layout needed to be with the integration of relationship to other uh, other UI on the screen. I want to position this button relative to this other uh, text field over here, but also the ability to add guidelines, to chain things together, um, just a, a rich visual experience that gives you what you need for uh, designing these rich APIs. And then we layer on top of that the subclass of constraint layout called motion layout, which allows you to develop these transitions between states of uh, of constraint layout where you have a beginning, you have an end, and then you can design this custom animation that uh, goes between them. Not only that, but the ability to then scrub between them based on user interaction on the screen. It's really powerful. Life cycles, this was the traditional view of it. Um, this is the complex diagram that every Android developer really needed to understand very deeply and integrate with very deeply. Uh, and in addition to that, you had these uh, methods in activity or app compat activity that you needed to implement in order to figure out what state your application was in. And it was really important for your application to know that state because you didn't want to leak resources or crash because you made some bad assumption about uh, what references were still live in your application. So you need to do all this stuff and now you do not. You should still have a basic understanding of life cycle, don't get me wrong, uh, but the actual way of integrating with that uh, in uh, in your application is much different. Now you have this concept of life cycles um, where you can actually observe changes. So instead of overriding these activity methods, uh, you observe these changes and then you can find out when things happen in the life cycles or you can actually query them. It's kind of odd to me in hindsight why we didn't, why this wasn't there to begin with the ability to just say, hey, what life cycle uh, uh, stage am I in right now? Um, and now you can with the uh, ability in the Jetpack libraries of life cycles actually do what we wanted to do from the beginning. A uh, little visual of this. So you have basically all your UI code on one side and then the data uh, logic needs to be somewhere else. Don't mush it all together all in a single activity class. It gets really messy, as I think we all know. Um, so now from your UI, you can observe on the changes. Uh, and then when the data changes, you get this message back and then you can react to it in your UI, allowing you this easy uh, separation of concerns here and keeping the logic where it needs to be on both sides. Uh, if you add room to this equation, so now you have local persistence uh, in some SQLite database, uh, and it's the same sort of interaction here, observation and uh, change messages going back and forth. If we look at a little bit of the API details, we have this uh, room uh, DAO here where we've got these uh, uh, suspend functions which allow you to very easily integrate the ability to then call these from whatever thread you need to because it is going to uh, do the right thing and stay off the UI thread. It's a lot easier to integrate this into um, the, the threading model that you need to have in Android applications. If you, uh, uh, let's see, we will, yes. Uh, so one of the one of the things that we're trying to get at with modern Android development and specifically the architecture component stuff um, is integrating all the stuff so that it works together. So view model and live data um, are all lifecycle aware. So they're all integrated with the, uh, the same capabilities between those APIs. Uh, you can access room through the view model and live data objects that you're using. Uh, room uses coroutines and flow in the later releases there. Um, keeping that database access onto the threads where it needs to be and off the threads where it shouldn't be. 
Um, and also I should point out that if you are using Rx Java, we realize that people use that. We're not trying to move people over to use um, all of the approaches that we're talking about here. You don't have to rewrite your application. Um, we actually have APIs that uh, are Rx Java friendly, so you can integrate some of what we're talking about here with the existing architecture that you already have in your application. Navigation that Romain mentioned uh, earlier makes it much easier to design the flow through your application and see it visually in the tool, which is really powerful. Um, so here's, you know, you, you select base activity. This is integrated in the templates in newer Android Studio releases where you say, I want a basic activity. And then it actually builds in the navigation capability from the beginning. And then you can go and design this flow and create the actions that um, navigate between destinations here. And then underlying that design, of course, because it's Android Studio and this is how tools work, is an XML file and you can edit the XML Directly, you see a couple of fragments there that are going to get swapped out as you navigate to different destinations in your app. Uh, and you do that by calling code that says navigate, and then you specify one of those actions that you defined in the tool. Uh, there are other capabilities. I'm going to rip through this, actually. Um, I will point you to the documentation on navigation to learn more. Uh, but uh, one, of the, one of the highlights here is, uh, wouldn't it be nice if up versus back was actually consistent between applications? That is one of the things that navigation is trying to achieve. Um, make it much easier for you to do this, and therefore make it easier for all applications to have consistent uh, capabilities. If we take a look at Work Manager, um, the ability to run deferrable uh, work uh, in a much easier way. Um, it's uh, It integrates, basically you can think of it as integrating the three approaches that every application had to do on their own, which was trying to use the uh, platform capability for Job Dispatcher. And if that didn't exist, well, what about that Firebase Job Dispatcher thing? Uh, or if not that, then maybe Alarm Manager. And it, it has all of those under a single API and does the right thing um, based on what release and what capabilities the device has at runtime. Goes all the way back to API level 14, um, supports all these different capabilities. Let me just take a look, a, a really quick look at an example here. Let's say you have an image that you want to run three different filters on in parallel, and then you want to compress the result, and then you want to upload it. Um, you can set constraints for the, each of these stages to make sure that this uh, deferrable work is happening at the right time, at the right time according to um, what's going on with the device. Uh, Take a look at the code here. You can say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here are some constraints that we're going to build in. I require that this this only run uh, when the battery is not low. And then we go ahead and create the work uh, here and set the constraints on it. Uh, and then we can say, okay, start this thing and run these things in parallel. Um, or maybe then we add these other things, say run these first three in parallel and then do the compression and then the upload. Uh, and then we enqueue that work and work manager handles the details of actually uh, managing that thing. If the application gets killed, um, it can still be in the queue and happen later as necessary. So simplifies all that stuff that was fairly complicated to um, for developers to handle on their own previously. Um, really quick look at camera X. Uh, the, we are trying to simplify the um, development of camera applications, not just from an API standpoint, this focuses on sort of three core use cases that most applications want to do, um, but also across a vast ecosystem where all of the devices offer some different camera uh, capabilities in different ways and, and developers had to do workarounds in their code. You can think of Camera X as building in a lot of the workarounds into the library that previously you may have had to build into your application for specific device use cases. Uh, again, I'm going to rip through really quickly because apparently we're already over time. Um, at the same time, uh, we released uh, all of these APIs that we're talking about, this, this uh, Jetpack subset. These things are coming out all the time. Uh, new bug fix releases or you know, ver new versions of alpha, beta, um, stable, uh, new capabilities. Uh, but the great thing about the Unbundle libraries is you can take these on at any time, build it into your application, and um, and then ship it as opposed to the platform APIs that then you're beholden to when your users actually get that release um, for taking on the, that new functionality or the new bug fixes. Um, new APIs are in development constantly. Uh, Roma mentioned Jetpack Compose, also Hilt um, for dependency injection, uh, the Paging 3 rewrite to make it much easier for doing asynchronous updates into Recycle Review from a database. Um, and then finally, I want to, again, really quickly talk about the, the fourth um, pillar of modern Android developments, uh, which is 
app bundles. Um, this is a new way of distributing applications that we came out with uh, in the last couple of years that makes it much easier and more powerful um, for you as application developers, but also better for your users for reasons I'll get into here. So we launched uh, back in 2018. Uh, that, that was a really short history, wasn't it? We're not going to take you through the timeline. That's it. We launched. Uh, so the reality is a lot of devices out there in wide, wide world in the huge ecosystem that Android has have very limited space. And that has a couple of really strong implications. Um, one is that users on these really constrained devices are constantly uninstalling applications because they simply don't have enough space. So wouldn't it be nice if your application was smaller so it didn't get uninstalled to make room for other applications or they didn't have to uninstall others to make room for yours? Um, also, as applications get bigger, we see uh, more and more failures of applications to install, whether that's you know users deciding not to deal with it, bandwidth problems, whatever it is, um, the success rate is much higher for smaller applications. Um, and also, the smaller an application is, the more likely it is for users to want to install it because of all these dynamics here. So we can visualize app bundles versus the traditional APK approach as this, in an APK, the entire thing is going to get installed. With an app bundle, it's a superset of all the configurations that all of the devices need. And then uh, the, the Play Store uh, will basically build an application for you on the server side and only ship down to the device what the device needs for their specific um, uh, configuration, whether it's you know the screen format configuration um, or the locale that the user is using or whatever. A uh, couple of different ways of visualizing this, um, not important. The momentum is pretty huge. Over uh, 500,000 applications in production using app bundles, and tons and tons of um, installs and top apps that are actually using this far. This so far, we encourage you to use it. Um, not only that, but uh, I believe it's a requirement for new apps sometime in next year. So please do spin up on app bundles. It is the way of the future. Um, and uh, this is where it's really important for your users. You get automatic um, size savings of uh, on average 20% just because we're sort of doing the things that otherwise you would have had to manually manage uh, on your own. Uh, so if we, so I'll walk really quickly through this. So basically we talked about modern Android development, the pillars, we're talking about Kotlin on the language front, Android Studio on the tool front, all of the APIs that I went through and more. Uh, and distribution is the Android app bundle approach. Um, there is a website where we have more information about all of this stuff. And that's it. Thanks. Uh, so I think um, there's John. Howdy. I've been watching the chat as uh, while I was talking, and I did not see a lot of questions there. So No. Yeah. The, uh, the only question, which might not be one you want to tackle on uh, – the stream. Oh, here's some few coming in. I say there's one that was uh, regarding app bundles. Does anyone at Google want to address uh, commonsware.com slash blog uh, with the title? The un un uncomfortable questions about app signing. I don't know if you want to tackle that. That might be bigger than than right now. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, well, it's it's bigger for one reason that I haven't seen that, so I have no idea what he's talking about. I would recommend though. There's a great article that um, Voitech posted on. Medium in the Android developers publication that talks about app signing. There, there's there's two main areas when I think about app bundles. One is the size savings um, and the management of multiple APAs. Um, that's really what I talked about in these slides here. But there's something else about app signing, which basically allows Google to manage your keys. And you can either have Google sign it with a key that we generate um, or you, if you're ex using an existing key, obviously you don't want to create a new one because then it's you know new application. Um, but you can upload that key and let Google manage it for you. And one of the reasons to do that is imagine a dark day when you actually lose your key. Um, it's a really bad thing because that, it's not like we can get it back for you or just say, yeah, sure, we we know who you are. No, no, no. If the key is gone, the key is gone, and then you have to go through this horrible process of creating a new application just because you lost your key. It's like it's like losing the key to your house, and therefore you have to move. Um, so there. Anyway, uh, the Voitex article covers that aspect of app bundles. I would I would encourage you to check that out. I will check out um, Mark Murphy's article in the meantime, but I, I can't really address the specific cons that he has there. 
Cool. Uh, we did get uh, two other questions. Uh, any comments on Flutter and where that fits in with modern Android development? Uh, doesn't, has nothing to do with what we talked about today. And any idea if there will be an official Google, oh, and Mark Murphy's post. All right. <laughs> Then that might, uh, All right, yeah, Ryan just answered that. All right, looks like there are no further questions. See, you guys are worried about time. We have plenty. <laughs> Everyone is either still waking up or just in shock, so. <laughs> uh, okay, then I guess that will yeah. do it. Yeah, I was just saying, I don't, if, uh, if anyone has any questions, oh, there was a request for your slide. So if you're willing to share those, you can just throw them in the the chat room on Slack channel. Um, chat room? You have a chat room? There definitely is a chat room. Okay, I think of having chat rooms, but I think chat room is appropriate. Way better. Um, but yeah, so if you want to throw the slides in there, but uh, other than that, yeah, if you've got any further questions for these guys, feel free to ask them in Slack in the in their chat room, and. Um, with that, uh, we've got just under about eight minutes until our next talk. So reload your coffees, answer emails, get a little bit of work done, and we will see everyone back here in a few minutes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay.